The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. It's really a privilege to bring you God's Word this morning. It's part of a series, of course, that we're doing from the Gospel of John, uh, setting forth Jesus' I Am statements. I'm sure you're aware of that. And today we're going to be looking at Jesus' declaration that He is the Good Shepherd. And our text will be John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. In terms of just a brief outline, verse 11 kind of sets the topic for us. And then uh, verses 12 and 13 talk about His sacrifice in in contrast to false shepherds. Verses 14 and 15 talk about his sacrifice, bringing his sheep into an intimate love relationship with him. Verse 16 talks about his sacrifice being for all the sheep that he will call to himself. And then in 17 and 18, we're going to have the joy of seeing how his sacrifice is made freely out of love for the Father and for us. So that's where we're going. Um. The other guys had outlines. I figured I better had one, have one. So there, there it is. <laughs> so that's something we're going to talk about it. So before we begin, uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless this time together. Father, we, we just humbly bow before you. We, we can't even begin to grasp your beauty and your majesty and your glory and your goodness. It's infinite. Your being is infinitely beautiful and perfect. And yet, in your mercy, you have been pleased to reveal yourself to us, setting a plan in motion that sets on display the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus, for all eternity, the one in whose glory glorious face we will see your glory it's through him that we can know you and love you and delight in what we see so please please set him on display this morning superintend over what's said from this pulpit for the glory of Christ I pray we give our time to you for his sake unto the glory of your name father <clears throat> All right. Here we go. As Joel po- pointed out last Sunday, most of the I am uh, statements include a predicate <clears throat> with the emphatic statement in the Greek, ego a me, literally I, I am, which recalls the covenant name of God, Yahweh, in Exodus chapter 3, as Joel so wonderfully set forth for us. And many of uh, these I am statements, predicates, reflect a metaphorical idea, uh, such as, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the true vine, I am the door of the sheep. This morning we have another metaphor. Uh, And I think you will agree that a metaphor can be a, a, a wonderfully powerful way to express truth, truth you want to get across. And and God uses these metaphors to cause us to think and to drive eternal truth deep into our hearts. This morning, the metaphor that sums up our message is found in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Just think for a minute about the wealth of truth, eternal truth contained in this short, inspired declaration by Jesus about himself. Just take a walk sometime and take that verse and just dwell on it and think about what it brings up to your mind. This verse, in a very profound and wonderful way, tells us who Jesus is and what Jesus does. 
The rest of the verses this morning in our text will help to fill out the picture of who he is and what he does. <clears throat> so let's begin then by first looking at who Jesus is. I am the good shepherd. This image or metaphor, <clears throat> it has a rich history in the Old Testament as it describes God's relationship to his people Israel as he is their shepherd. From the very beginning of the nation, we read this in Genesis, as Jacob, near the end of his life, blesses Joseph's sons. In Genesis 48, 15, and 16, he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd, my shepherd all my life to this day, through all the ups and downs and the trials and the troubles and the pains and the heartache, the Lord God has been my shepherd. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and may my name live on in them. In the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. He said, the Lord God is his shepherd. The Psalms declare this to us as well. Psalm 23, 1, you all know David, the shepherd boy, the shepherd's psalm. How does he, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. And he talks about how <clears throat> the Lord functions as a shepherd to him, nurturing, caring, leading paths of righteousness, so many good things. <clears throat> Psalm 28, 9. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. Shepherds carry sheep. Psalm 80, verse 1. O oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. I think you get the point. This great God of covenant promise is described as a God who shepherds his people individually like, and corporately. Most of us who have never had anything to do with shepherds, that's true for me, and sheep, basically understand what this means, I think. If you're a child of God, Psalm 23 is rich and personal and a great comfort to you. Right? What, what does a shepherd do? We know. <clears throat> he protects. He defends. He guides. He cares for. He feeds. He watches over. Sometimes he does carry, doesn't he? The sheep. He leads. And he knows his sheep. Without a shepherd, what? Sheep are basically helpless to care for themselves. <clears throat> They're easy prey for predators, right? Wolves and bears and lions. And... They're easily scattered and lost. Sheep are helpless, defenseless, and I would add dumb animals. How many college teams do you know that have a sheep as their mascot. <laughs> the mighty fighting sheep. I mean, they even have horn frogs and no sheep. <laughs> because we know what sheep are like. And that's what God calls us. <clears throat> In fact, I'd say God created sheep and shepherds so that we can understand, truly understand truth about how he relates to his people. To show us how helpless and defenseless and foolish we are and how much we need him. How much we need him. So, what is amazing and what prepares the way for Jesus' declaration this morning is that as Revelation progresses, we saw, you know, right off the bat, Jacob and God. God moves in history to set his son on display 
for His glory as the fulfillment of all promise and prophecy. God connects, as history moves forward, God connects His role as shepherd to the Davidic kingship. This is really wonderful. 2 Samuel 5, 2, as David is being addressed, previously when Saul was king over us, you, David, were the one who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, you, David, will shepherd my people Israel. And you will be a ruler over Israel. Psalm 78, 70 through 72. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfold, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs. He brought him to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. <clears throat> so he shepherded them according to to the integrity of his heart and guided them with skillful hands. David was an example of a shepherd king doing what God wanted him to do. But, and like David, the Davidic kings who followed him were to shepherd God's people according to the integrity of their heart. But, for a few exceptions, they failed miserably because they had no heart for God. Can't shepherd if you have no heart for God. So what happened? This failure, along with the sinful hearts of the people, resulted in exile and historical discontinuation of the Davidic kingship. Tragedy. God declared His anger for the wicked shepherds and promised to send His shepherd, the Messiah, into history. At the proper time, in fulfillment of promise He made to David, He would be David's greater son, the ideal Davidic king, and shepherd according to the integrity of His pure heart. We read this in Jeremiah 23, God's perspective. <clears throat> Woe to the shepherds! who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I'm about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them. And they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Who is that? The Lord Jesus. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. I'm going to send him to you. The Messiah would reflect... God's heart, described in Isaiah 40, verse 11. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. These few Old Testament texts, and by the way, there's many more, many more, help set the context for Jesus' declaration in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And let's just say this too, in the context of John's gospel, from the very beginning of the book, his goodness is directly related to the reality that he is the eternal word, right? Ever with the Father, who became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, 
full of grace and truth. That's why he's the good shepherd. That's who he is. That's who he is. Now let's put together who Jesus is with what he does. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. As Jesus makes this magnificent statement, he sets himself in contrast to those who profess to have responsibility for the sheep, but are false shepherds. Certainly, these would be the religious leaders of Israel, including the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, especially, that he was in constant conflict with. In verses 12 and 13, he says this, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming. Danger. And he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. Not concerned about the sheep. So the characteristics of those who are not shepherds, Jesus says, include this. From, we can go back to verses 8 and 10 as well. They are thieves and robbers who come only to steal and kill and destroy the sheep. Right? They're hired hands who will not protect the sheep when they are threatened by enemies, allowing them to be snatched and scattered. When danger approaches, they flee because they are not concerned about the sheep. What are they concerned about? It's obvious, isn't it? They're, they're concerned about themselves. They're all about themselves. What's in it for me? They're selfish and self-centered. Uh, I think they're perfectly exemplified by the self-righteous, hypocritical Pharisees who condemned, do you remember the man born blind in John chapter 9, David Chandler, clearly pointed that out a couple weeks ago. That, that's what they're about. And yet they're in these positions of leadership over the sheep. Such men are described and condemned by God in Ezekiel 34, 1 through 5. Listen to this. <clears throat> then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel! who have been feeding themselves, not the sheep. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field. And were scattered. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36? He said, seeing the people, the multitudes, he felt compassion for them. Why? Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. So God's glorious remedy to deal with corrupt, self-indulgent, self-centered self-absorbed, self-righteous, hypocritical leadership was to send the good shepherd into the world. Send the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The 
good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd, unlike the false shepherds, is truly concerned about the sheep. He cares about the sheep, truly cares about the sheep. Why? Because he owns the sheep. They belong to him. They belong to him. He came to lay down his life to deliver the sheep from the their enemies and and give them the abundant life talked about in this context. He's the good shepherd. And dear people, I think this contrast highlights for us the need in the church to have men in leadership who reflect the beauty of the good shepherd. Man, it's the death of a church if you don't have men who reflect the beauty of Christ and are described in these other ways. And there are churches all over this country that have men who are in it for what they can get out of it and using the sheep to accomplish their own ends and goals. Just a reality. Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain. It's not for what you can get out of it that you enter into this office, but with eagerness, eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, heavy-handed leadership, but proving to be examples to the flock. Wow. What did Paul say? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Leaders had better be able to say that. None of us are going to be perfect, but the bottom line is we had better in general, for sure, be able to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So what do we need? We need men who reflect the beauty of the good shepherd, right? That's what we need. So, This marvelous metaphor declares to us, I think, the concrete truths of the gospel. And now in verses 14 14 through 18, we want to consider his glorious sacrifice for the sheep. I think first and foundational, Jesus, as the good shepherd king of his people, lays his life down for them. That little preposition for is the Greek uh, huper, which means on behalf of or for the sake of someone else. It's used this way in Ephesians 5, 2, where Paul says, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. There it is. Gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. John the Baptist declared about Jesus, of course, you're familiar, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So what did he do for us in offering himself up for us as God's sacrificial lamb? What did he do? I'm sure you, many of you can answer. Here's what he did. He bore the full, infinite wrath of God in the place of his people. He was crushed by the Father. You see that in Isaiah 53. Under his hand of wrath and judgment in the place of his people so they can enjoy an eternal love relationship with God forever, as we're going to see in verses 14 and 15. 
So we have to pause and we're going to reflect as we go through this great gospel message. Do you belong to the Good Shepherd today? Are you one of his sheep? You know, it's easy to say that, but we're going to see that if this is true for you, that other things will be true as well. Are you one of his sheep? Have you placed your faith and trust in him as your substitute sacrifice? Your lamb bearing the full weight of God's justice and wrath against you because of your sin against him. By grace, through faith, and his finished work on the cross, you can become part of his flock today. You can have him as your shepherd. Verses 14 and 15. And let me just say there are, there are definitely some sitting here who, who need him as their shepherd. I can guarantee that. Not everyone who walked in this door this morning has him as their shepherd. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus again repeats his declaration that he is the good shepherd. And that he lays down his life for the sheep. But in the middle, in the middle of this same declaration in, that, that was in verse 11, of repeating the statement there, he adds, And I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. So what's, what's going on? The truth being communicated here is that those for whom Jesus lays down his life are brought into an intimate love relationship with Him. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust purpose, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So the ultimate reason why Jesus lays down His life for His sheep, His people, is to remove every obstacle that stands in the way of them being brought into an eternal love relationship with Him and God. This is the abundant life spoken of earlier in verse 10. Let's think about it some more. In John chapter 17, later in John here, before the cross, as He is praying to the Father, Jesus says in John 17, 3, this is eternal life. What is eternal life? that they may know you. Oh, here we go again. Know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus defines eternal life as knowing the Father and the Son. In 25 and 26 of that chapter, Jesus says, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. I have known you, Father, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, the beauty of your person known to them, and will make it known. How did he do that? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I've made your name known to them, and I'm going to continue to make it known. Purpose, so that the love with which you loved me, Father, may be in them, and I in them. This magnificent reality that God shares His love for the Son with His people. And Jesus, His love for the Father. So let's, let's just say this. If this is why Jesus gave up His life for His people, it is vitally important to understand what he means when he says he knows his own and they know him. Wouldn't you agree with that? If you miss this, you're going to miss everything for all time. Notice that he directly compares it to his relationship with his father. Even as the father knows me and I know the father. This means... 
that Jesus' love relationship with His Father is to be reflected in our love relationship with Him and God. And if this is not true, for anyone, they have not been saved. If this is not true for anyone here, you haven't been saved. So here are a few thoughts to consider. Because many people are claiming today that they know God. Isn't that true? All over the place. Movie stars, athletes, politicians. I know God. You can't tell me I don't. They, they know the God they think is God. but not the God of the Bible. But in reality, then, they, they say it, but they don't really know him. So let's talk about it a little bit, okay? I don't want anyone here to miss these things. Your, your and my eternal destiny is on the line here, folks. This, this has to be truly grasped, heart grasped. Because there are people here who say they know God and they do not know God. So first, first, <clears throat> Jesus' knowledge of his Father was not simply an intellectual knowledge. I mean, that's just obvious. And, and I would say many people in the church know a great deal of truth about God. I mean, we're, we, we major on that here at Southside. Communication of truth. Know a great deal of truth about God. And you know what? This is especially true, especially true, I think, for those who have grown up in the church and possibly been raised in a Christian home. Are, are there those here like that? We're all need to hear this, though. But knowing truth, because some of you don't know anything about it, you walked in and you've learned a lot. But knowing truth, and even enthusiastically agreeing with it. Man, I agree with that. That's right stuff, right on, man. Those are good doctrines. It does not mean that you know God the way Jesus knows the Father. It doesn't mean that. So it's just not about knowing stuff in your mind and agreeing with it, is it? Second, there's a misconception in the church, I think, that, that agape love, you know, to say you love God, it's the word agape, his love for us, our love for him. Agape love, the kind of love that is shared with us by the Father, for the Son, mentioned in John 17, 26, uh, there's a misconception that this kind of love is primarily defined as an act of the will. Man, I'm telling you, this can give a faulty impression that willfully doing what God commands equates to loving Him. I just got to do all the stuff, man, and I'm going to show I really love God. Listen to what the Greek lexicon defines agape as. Please listen to this. Here it is, right off the bat. The quality of warm, warm regard, affection, esteem, or love for an interest in another. Did you get that? Jonathan Edwards defined this love for God as having holy affections for Him. To say that this kind of love is primarily an act of the will is very misleading. 
and certainly not the way Jesus loved his father. Would you agree with that? You have to get this, people. Because many are sitting here and they're just doing stuff. But when you start talking about the affections of the heart that drive you, I don't know if I really get that. Just give me stuff to do, please. Come on. Let's be practical. Let's just be practical about it. Don't take me into this other realm. You know why it's so staggering to talk this way? Because you can't produce this love by things you do. This is supernatural, people. This is the Spirit within you stirring those affections for Christ. You can't do it on your own. It's what Christianity is all about. So don't define the terms in ways that put the ball in man's court. Because that's not the way the word's defined. That's not how Jesus... How did Jesus love? Jesus loved his Father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Just like we're commanded to do. And he had impeccable, warm regard, affection, esteem, and love for his Father. Which as we will see in verses 17 and 18, undergirded his loving, willing obedience to his Father. And He is our example. He's our example. Our obedience to Him, a true Christian's obedience to Him, flows out of love for Him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Dear people, it is affection for Christ that moves the will in obedience to Christ. If that's not true, you're not a Christian. People can know things about God and do things that the Word commands, but not truly know God in an intimate, joyful, personal, love-faith relationship. Isn't that true? They have no holy affections for God. People like the Pharisees, man, we know what to do and we're doing it, but they didn't care about God. They didn't love God. They had no affections for God. They put Him to death. These kinds of people, knowing and doing like them, they will be the ones who hear from the shepherd king one day, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. May the good shepherd confirm in your heart this morning. His declaration, I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. If this is not settled in your heart this morning, if this is kind of, I don't really know what he's talking about, if you know nothing about warm, holy affections for Christ, and your life is maybe summed up by this joyless knowing and doing Please ask God for His mercy and grace so that you can behold His glory in the face of His beloved Son and love Him and embrace Him by faith as your Savior, Shepherd, and King this morning. And, and if you, after the service, if you have questions, you come talk to me or any of our men, our elders. Please, don't walk out of here. If this is confusing to you, because this is the work of the Spirit in the new heart, there must be holy affections for Jesus Christ. Right? In John 10:16. We have a declaration by Jesus that this good news, man, this gospel, this good news about the Good Shepherd is for men from every tribe and tongue 
and nation, not just for the nation of Israel. It is for them, but not just them. The other sheep, I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. The other sheep are those outside of the nation of Israel in the context that the good shepherd will bring to himself. Notice, notice in that text, I must bring them. That's a divine must, people. That is a divine must. It's going to happen. Nothing will stop God from bringing these other sheep into the flock through the call of the shepherd. I must bring them, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. The absolute, this is wonderful, the absolute certainty of this happening is because of God's promise to Abraham long ago. God's a God who keeps his word. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And praise God, he added this at the end. And, if, and in you, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. People, that's us. Praise God for that last part of the promise. Let me just read what Paul states in Ephesians chapter 2. What a wonderful declaration, especially to those of us who didn't have the privileges of being close to God like the Jews. This is what he says to the Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. That's us. Which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember, he says, remember, you better remember this. Because this is all God's marvelous grace to us. That you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Hopeless situation. But now, but now, one of Ken's but, <laughs> but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier, the dividing wall, by abolishing his flesh, the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. There was always animosity between the Jews and the Gentiles all the time. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. By it, the cross, having put to death the enmity. And he came, he came, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Folks, this is unbelievably marvelous. The unity we have in the body of Christ is because the good shepherd laid down his life for all the sheep. <laughs> he owns all the sheep. The good news about the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep is to go to all the nations. All the nations. And you know what? There will be a response to this good news. Because the good shepherd must, divine must, bring these other sheep into the flock. And as the, good shepherd, as the gospel is proclaimed about him, his sheep will hear his voice and come to him. I don't care where you go in this, on this planet. This is an absolute reality. It doesn't matter what nation, it doesn't matter how dark, how hard, 
this is a reality. It's going to happen. That's why Jesus said, we need workers and laborers in the harvest to go proclaim this message. Maybe, maybe for the first time in your life, today, you are hearing the voice of the shepherd declaring uh, that he laid down his life to rescue lost, helpless, hopeless, defenseless sheep like you who have gone astray and turned to their own way running down a path of sin and despair and darkness and eternal destruction. Oh, hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. Um, Let everything else go. I don't care what it is. Let it go. Let everything else go and run into His arms by faith. And He will carry you and protect you and comfort you, and care for you, and guide you, and love you for all eternity. He's the Good Shepherd. Boy, if you hear His voice today, respond. Respond. As we finish up this morning, we have the privilege of reflecting on the words of Jesus as he speaks to us about his love relationship with his Father. It's marvelous. He shares his heart with us and shows us that what moved him to go to the cross, what moved him to go to the cross and lay down his life for his sheep. 10, 17, and 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me. No one has taken it from me. But I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. In these two verses, we see an expression, I think, of the intimate love relationship that has ever existed between the Father and the Son. Eternity past. The Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world. It tells us in John 17, 24, from eternity past, the Son, as the second person of the Godhead, has functioned in joyful, loving submission to the Father. It's who He is. And as the will of God is carried out in time... In history, the Son freely entered into history to do the Father's will out of infinite love for the Father to bring glory to the Father and love for His sheep. And love for His sheep. From eternity past, the Father has loved His beloved Son. And the Son's obedience to the Father in history sets His love for the Father on display. For the created universe to behold, the cross is the greatest display of the Son's love for His Father and free, free submission to His will. John 14, 31. But so that the world may know, He's about ready to leave the upper room and go to the cross, but so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. I think Jesus makes it clear in these texts that He has, that as He accomplished the will or command of the Father, that He did so freely and willingly under no external compulsion whatsoever. It was His delight to do His Father's will as He functioned under His Father's authority. No one has taken my life away from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. 
I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up. This commandment I received from my Father. What God the Father predestined to occur was the joyful, loving desire of the Son to accomplish before time, in time, and forever. Isn't that great? So let's conclude with two things. Just First, don't miss this. In the fulfillment of his Father's will, Jesus had, has authority not only, had authority not only to lay, lay his life down, but also to take it up again. <laughs> his willing, sacrificial death was swallowed up in resurrection glory. As we will see later in our series, Jesus declares with divine authority, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. That's who He is. And second, finally, by way of application, just keep this with you, His obedience to His Father out of love for His Father, obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross, is our example. It's our example. In the power of the Spirit, dear people, if you're His, we have the privilege of obeying Him out of love for Him. And, and as you do that, you're going to show the world dwelling in darkness that you love Him more than your own life. More than your own life, like He did with His Father. May Jesus be your good shepherd this morning. If He is not, Run into his arms. He will pick you up like a little lamb picked up by the shepherd, brought close to his own heart to be carried and protected and loved forever. Love forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Oh, we thank you for the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. I pray that we would just rejoice in the beauty of his person. Thank you for who he is. Thank you that in laying down his life, he brings poor, defenseless, foolish sheep into a love relationship with the living God for all eternity. Thank you that he's our example of what it means to obey God out of love for God. And thank you that he is the one who shows us truly what it means to know God and be known by God. May you drive these truths home to our hearts this morning. Cause us to rejoice in the reality that he is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I pray everyone in here would be able to say that for the glory of your great name, dear Father, through your Son. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.